Again, listeners, welcome to another footnote episode. Uh, I'm Alex Sargent, uh, and I'm Chris Holiday. Today, we're talking about stop motion animation. We've done animation broadly, um, but we felt we could now uh, go into the world of, of the particular style of, of animation that is stop motion. I've already said the word style. I'm regretting it because I suspect Chris is going to pick me up on that in just a second. Um, but Chris, ten minutes on stop motion. Think you're up for it? Uh, well, <laughs> yes. I'll I'll give it a, I'll give it a good go. All right. Well, I got the easy job. I'm asking the questions this time. So. Uh, off we go. Okay. What so, is it? <laughs> well, so so I would say that in many ways, stop motion, I, I think for a lot of practitioners, and I know stop motion is one of the most labor intensive forms of, of, of animation, but uh, in many ways, I think it kind of crystallizes what animation is about in terms of the, the illusion of movement. So the definitions of animation rooted in uh, the, the ability of, of objects, of well, any object really in stop motion, objects, uh, puppets to be awarded sentience and volition and intention as part of the kind of magic and wonder of, of, of animation. But the re- and the reason I say that stop motion kind of crystallizes some of the the issues around animation is because it's about moving an object incrementally frame by frame so moving an object taking an image moving an object taking an image and it's that sort of hands-on labor where any object can be made to move um, as part of that as part of that illusion now of course when i say any object it could be this coffee cup that's yeah. sitting in front of us so just so listeners just to make yeah, yeah, sure yeah. we we kind of yeah, pr- proof yeah. this what literally would you do to stop animate to stop animate Stop motion animate a coffee cup. Okay, so I would, um, I could build a set, but I didn't need, wouldn't need to. No, sure. I could um, set up a camera, and mm-hmm. I would take a still image mm-hmm. of this uh, coffee cup, this mm-hmm. drunk coffee cup, I Good. should say. Good. Um, and I could do several things. I could take a photograph of it, and then I could move it a fraction to the left or to the right, or topple it over, or mm-hmm. part topple it over. Take another picture. Uh, move it again, take it. and part of that again, going back to this sort of flipbook yeah. analogy. Um, and again, actually, I think this is why uh, animation is often seen as as including live action, because what is live action if not the illusion of still images sped up to create to create movement? So you could take a series of probably about twenty four a frame, let's say a second, twenty four frames a second, uh, and take twenty four photographs of this coffee cup and have it move um, from the table as it is on the mm-hmm. right uh, to the other side of the of the table. I could also um, do something a little bit more extravagant. Sure. I could create a mouth. I could give it, I could characterize it. And mm-hmm. this is one of the big things of stop motion is that you can take any object and turn it into a sentient being. Pixar did a playful iteration of this with their computer animated shorts by taking a, a lamp. Um, but there are many, many artists working in, in America and across Europe. And, and actually Europe in particular has a, a particularly strong stop motion tradition. Um, Yuri Tninka, um, Jan Svankmeyer, two of perhaps the, the most well-known, uh, I would say, animators working in the sort of 70s and 80s and then more recently the, the Quay brothers um, that Suzanne Bucken has written about in terms of them giving life yeah. and intention and, and the, the illusion of sentience to things like screws, screws that suddenly um, spin out seemingly of their own accord Mm -hmm. and move as if they are um, kind of, yeah, characters of themselves. So what are the, where where did we first see stop motion appearing in in film history? Is it right at the beginning, like the other animation forms we talked about in the previous one, or is it kind of slightly later on? It sounds quite labor intensive and quite technological to me, so. Yes, so I suppose one of the, uh, it, it does have a tradition, so it's not, it's, it's not like computer animated filmmaking. I think you can often map animation history in terms of it. It did its sell. It did its sort of post-war, you know, the, the explosion of perhaps Eastern European um, stop motion animation. And then we mm. moved into the digital era. But actually the breaks between those pit time periods are a lot fuzzier than we perhaps give them credit for. And this is definitely the case with uh, we didn't move from cell animation to stop motion. Stop motion effects. Well, first of all, you could argue that cell animation is a form of stopped motion in the way that drawings are drawn 
and you know, going back to the, the sort of lightning sketch tradition yeah, that we talked yeah, about previously. Yeah. And you made that point about live action already. Like actually, yeah. live action is essentially stopped motion and yeah. then played back. Yeah, got it, right. But I think probably one of the, the, the earliest and most pronounced stop motion animators is Starovich. Um, and he would make films using essentially dead insects, and he would get these like grasshoppers and, and um, you know mosquito insects essentially, and, and get them to move across the screen and create little scenarios, create little sort of romantic comedies with right. with um, yeah with with insects. And of course, um, in the, the fantasy animation book, we've got um, a chapter by Francis Agnoli that kind of talks about. Um, Early, early stop motion in the kind of French and, and German context. So there are these traditions of stop motion in the in the tens and, and the twenties. But um, yeah, it's something. That's and as and old I guess as in Hollywood you've got people like um, I don't know it's from my fantasy hat uh, uh, like Willis O'Brien. And, yeah, yeah. Um, so, that, so, the, so that's um, King Kong in the thirties. Yeah, Lost World. Like you know, creature yeah, yeah. features, right? Yeah. Yep. So it's used as a special effect in Hollywood. Yeah. And it's quite like technological and in, and spectacular and, and labor intensive and industry intensive but actually it sounds like in Europe it's actually the opposite it's objects almost like a found object aesthetic yeah yeah on. there's there's a lot of that sort of cabinet of curiosities aesthetic I think to uh, and whether that's whether that's absolutely true or not um, is up for debate but there's certainly a sense in which there are certain animators being able to to create life as part of animations uncanny stop motion animations are uncanny this things that can't move suddenly move with the special powers of animation and lots of writers again have sort of said that well stop motion is 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 slightly different because the objects can only move through the magic of of the camera they are and unlike cell animation where there is only a drawing if I move this coffee cup there is still a coffee cup in front of me sure. I can hold it and pick it up but it can't do the things that it does and, and yeah. you know, in terms of movement, uh, unless I view it through a camera and, and create an animation out of it, uh, and, I, and actually, I would say that there, there's a, a sort of accessibility, I think, to stop motion animation because a lot of kind of contemporary, um, I would say, apps on tablets and things, you know, a lot of workshops with with uh, children, animated workshops with children, mm. uh, do use programs on a, on a on a device that allow them to create kind of plasticine models that walk and they create their own little stop motion. So in many ways, it's one of the most accessible ways of animating because you can kind of take any object in the world. It doesn't have to be a puppet with movable joints. Yeah, it can yeah. be a coffee cup and you can create a character and personify it um, and give it that sort of anthropomorphic if we like, we're sure. gonna, we'll probably do that uh, as another, well. Another one. Another one. Um, but that sort of human, give human-like characteristics to any kind of object. So that's why, as I said right at the start, in many ways stop motion feels like yeah. the embodiment of what animation can do. It creates the illusion of movement where there is none. Right, you've got about three minutes left. Okay. We better do some contemporary examples. Yeah, I'm thinking yeah. Aardman, I'm thinking Leica. Um, talk, yep. talk about Aardman, start with. They're the British studio that we've covered a few times on the podcast. They all use plasticine, right? Yeah, well, yes, they do. So, so uh, cl claymation, to, to take their, their sort of industrial term for the way that they work, is has sort of been in this... Oh, and I think we've talked about this before. There's oil and water relationship with CGI because a lot of contemporary stop motion films, uh, spectators seem to like to find the bits that aren't stop motion at all. Well, they use it with digital, and so I would say that they're they're. There's a nice exchange, formal exchange in some of the Ardman films where you have perhaps CG backdrops, but you right. and same with Leica as well. Um, you have CG backdrops, but very much there's a, a labour intensive way of performing and these characters with this really complex armature uh, that are allowed to move through the labour of the, the animators. So I think Ar yeah, Ardman and Leica are, are two of the most pronounced contemporary. In an era of the digital, they are two of the most pronounced um, stop motion studios. And I've just realised we haven't even mentioned Harryhausen yet, so you've got a minute. Harryhausen, because that seems to also fit with what we're saying in that it, it's a very much a mixed media. People yeah, yeah. use stop motion in that case with digital, but yep. actually what Harryhausen's known for well, building on O'Brien's is things like, is, is the kind of dynamation, is putting live action and and stop motion together, right? Yes, yes. Uh, I suppose my get out here is that um, the nature of this this um, fantasy animation project means that uh, we can do Harry House and we do fantasy. But yes, oh, right, uh, yeah, yeah, but right. yes, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there is a uh, Harry House and and. It's difficult because we don't want to lapse into a great man narrative of, of the way in which animation has unfolded. But certainly Harryhausen, um, Jason and the, and the Argonauts and, and um, other films where there are, I suppose, part of that tradition, that Willis O'Brien tradition, that King Kong tradition of, of stop motion effects within a broader live action film uh, can't be ignored. OK, so it sounds like what we're saying here is that actually it's a paradox in that it's both very complicated and labour intensive, yes. but also has a kind of homely homemade yes, down to earth quite yeah. at exactly the same time and different studios different periods lean on 
those two yeah. identities at different points and all that. Yeah, yeah. Kind of and stuff. I would say there are definitely writers on on um, that sort of domestication of the handmade. Um, yeah, so okay. Rachel Mosley's book Handmade Television speaks a lot to that sort of tabletop um, and gendered way of thinking about stop motion. Right. Um, so what are some of the quick one of the examples that she talks about in that book? Or? Uh, so she talks about um, Bagpuss, which oh, yeah. is also the the, the topic of uh, of another project that, yeah. that Chris Pallant's working on. Um, but that sort of yeah tabletop cool. stop motion is is something that one can do at home. One yeah. doesn't need to be um, at Glendale, California. Sure. Okay, well, you've got 40 seconds. Any um, good texts for people to go to? Um, other, of course, the Rachel Mosley you've just mentioned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Else, so um, definitely for, uh, Rachel's book um, because it deals with television and television animation is, mm -hmm. is sort of under underwritten about, um, I think, more, more broadly. Um, Chris Pallant's work on... on um, Small films yep. who produce Bagpuss and, and so forth. That's not out yet, but maybe out by the time this comes out. I don't know. Uh, and I would also say um, Suzanne Buchan's writing on the Quay Brothers, where she sort of is a more, offers a more philosophical understanding of the potential of uh, an interdisciplinary uh, way of thinking about stop motion. Am I done? Yeah, you are. We haven't mentioned the Quay Brothers. With seven seconds yet, I would say check them out. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, that's been us for another episode. Uh, any suggestions for future uh, footnote episodes, questions, key terms, problems, ideas that you're having. Yeah. Um, or if you just want us to sort of slow down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, ten, the 10 minute format makes that difficult, but we'll do our best. Yes. Um, let us know. Fananim Research, F A N A N I M Research at gmail.com. That's the same handle for our Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram accounts as well. Um, we'll see you next time. Bye. <laughs> Thank you.